um, I'd like to introduce our panel here. Um, and, uh, you know, I think it's probably good form here and good luck to introduce my, my dear friend, Melanie Brown, on her birthday. So, uh, <laughs> I, yes, and um, I, I, for one, I think it's uh, totally appropriate to sing happy birthday. So I, I'm going to go ahead and leave <laughs> One and a two and a one, two, three. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear Melanie. Happy birthday to you. Thank you. Thank you so much. I'm going to tell you a little bit about my friend Melanie uh, is an organizer, but also a commercial fisherman in Bristol Bay with her famine, her, her famine family, her salmon family in Bristol Bay. Uh, and uh, has been doing it for, this is how many generations now? F fifth generation fisherman. And, you know, Melanie is uh, one of the most tireless human beings I know, advocating, fighting for constantly day and night, singing about and in love with wild salmon. And that's the thing that brought us together. And uh, Mel, I'm so happy you could be here again tonight and happy birthday you, to Mark. you. Thank you so much, Mark. Absolutely. Our second uh, panelist is Heather Hardcastle. And uh, be <laughs> Heather and I met, strangely enough, uh, years ago, our shared love for Southeast Alaska. Uh, this is not too weird that uh, brings a lot of people together. But I was working at a little lodge uh, in Southeast called Yes Bay Lodge. And Heather was uh, working for um, the Safari Spirit, I believe was the boat you were on. Is that right? Yes. Yeah. Yep. Uncruise Adventures. Uncruise Adventures, which is an amazing organization. And um, and uh, we, uh, we struck up a, a friendship. And who knew that 20 years later, we would be continuing it strong here. But a little background on Heather, she was born and raised in Juneau, Alaska, uh, and she's the Salmon Beyond Borders campaign advisor um, and grew up commercial fishing with her family near the mouth of the Taku River. After completing her master's degree in coastal environmental management at Duke in 2001, Heather and her family formed Taku River Reds, a company that markets and distributes the high quality salmon catch of Taku fishermen across the United States. She's also worked at Trout Unlimited to protect the Tongass National Forest salmon watersheds. For over four years, Heather led Salmon Beyond Borders as campaign director. Heather mostly enjoys long runs, skiff rides, hell yes, skiff rides, got <laughs> to do that, and hiking in the Alpine with family and friends, and uh, lives in Juneau. Uh, although you're in California right now, I think, yeah? Yes, I'm a bit of a migrator um, yes. these days. So I'm in wine country, California for the winter, and summers in Southeast. Oh, man. Yeah, <laughs> I don't even know what to do with that. That's, I know. Yeah, yeah. It's, that's it's, beautiful. Are you kidding? I won't complain. Yeah. No. Well, welcome, Heather. Thank you for coming tonight. Um, Thank you. And last but not least is um, our uh, our star for the evening, Amy Gulick, who's uh, an acclaimed nature photographer and writer. Uh, her images and stories have been featured in Outdoor Photographer, National Wildlife, Audubon, Sierra, and lots of other publications. Um, her work has received numerous honors, including the prestigious Daniel Hausberg Wilderness Image Award from the Alaska Conservation Foundation, the Voice of the Wild Award from the Alaska Wilderness League, and a Lowell Thomas Award from the Society of American Travel Writers Foundation. Uh, she's also a recipient of the Philip Hyde Grant for her work in Alaska's Tongass National Forest and a Mission Award, both presented by the North American Nature Photography Association. The book that I got to know Amy through is Salmon in the Tree, Life in Alaska's Tongass Rainforest. It's amazing. Um, and it's, uh, it's the winner of two Nautilus Book Awards and an independent, independent Publisher Book Award. Uh, Amy's a founding fellow of the International League of Conservation Photographers, a fellow with the International League of Conservation Writers, a member of the Society of Environmental Journalists, and a member of the North American Nature Photography Association, and author of the Salmon Way, and uh, is going to tell us all about it this evening. So Amy, um, I'd love to hear, and I think that's why we're all here. Um, take it away. Well, thank you. Well, hi, everyone. Um, thank you all for making the time uh, to be here. This is a, a great forum. You know, normally when I give a talk in person, you know, the, the people who come live fairly close to wherever it is I'm talking. So this is 
really a, a, a novel and interesting new way to, to get together with people from all over. Um, so it's kind of fun. Um, so again, thank you though for making the time. Um, and I'm, I'm super excited to share stories and photographs with you from my new book, uh, The Salmon Way. And a big thank you to Mark and his team um, at The Wild um, for bringing us together. And, but really, I, I like to think that it's the salmon you know, that have brought us together. And um, while many of us may or may not know each other here uh, tonight, we might leave here with stronger connections to each other, to the fish, to where the fish live, and to the people who live with them. So I always like to give thanks to the salmon uh, for helping us make these connections. And I'd also like to thank and acknowledge the Tulalip, the Snohomish, and the Coast Salish people uh, for being stewards of their homelands, um, where I now make my home uh, in Washington State's Puget Sound. So uh, as a writer and a photographer, I, I tell real life stories. I don't do fiction. I don't make things up. Um, but how do I decide which stories to pursue? You know, when you're a creative type, and Mark, a uh, filmmaker, is going to relate to this as well, it's like the whole world is just full of interesting stories. You know, but at some point, we kind of have to push a lot of things aside and really hunker down and focus on this one story that we're trying to tell. The Salmon Way took me five years to create, so that's a lot of time to commit to one story. Um, so how did I get this in my head that I was going to do this? Um, well, for any story, I think sometimes, uh, you know, I read something or I have a conversation uh, or I have some kind of an experience, you know, that sparks my curiosity, makes me want to know more. And a number of years ago, uh, I had a conversation with an Alaska Native woman, and, and I think it was that conversation that really got me on the path uh, to starting the Salmon Way. And this conversation, it's included in the book. It's under a little essay called Priceless. And uh, I'd like to read uh, just a part of you, or a part of that story to you now. And I'm going to share my screen uh, so you have something else to look at. Uh, let's see if this works. There we go. Uh, do that. All right, there we go. Stroking a thick white mountain goat hide placed next to a loom, I watched master weaver Terry Rothgar create a robe traditionally made from the animal's wool. Next to the hide are strips of spruce root, raw materials for her exquisite woven basket also on display. Terry tells stories about her clinket raven ancestors as her expert fingers weave a beautiful design. And I say to Terry, with such plentiful resources in your homeland, it's easy to see how your ancestors thrived. Resources, Terry says to me, mountain goats and trees aren't resources. We have relationships with the goat and the tree. Since time immemorial, Terry tells me, her people have lived along the forested coast of what is today Southeast Alaska, rich with spruce and cedar trees, mountain goats, salmon, bears, ravens, and eagles. To make items using spruce root and cedar bark, the people carefully harvested the roots and bark so that the trees could continue to live. Today, weavers use the same harvesting techniques. They knew the optimal time of year to hunt the mountain goat, so the animal's coat was in the best condition. And in addition to mountain goat wool, they also used the hide, horns, and meat. I wonder how Terry's ancestors, thousands of years ago, had the foresight to harvest bark or roots so as not to kill the trees. The forest must have seemed endless and in a constant state of regeneration in the soggy climate. But this mindfulness speaks to the difference between resources and relationships. When people live with deep connections to the land, water, animals, and plants that sustain them, it's impossible not to respect and develop relationships with trees, goats, salmon, and more. Resources, on the other hand, tend to refer to end products, commodities. It's tough to have a relationship with lumber, copper tubing, or frozen fish sticks. So I think it was really that chance encounter and that brief conversation with Terry uh, about relationships that sparked a lot of questions in my mind. And that's how a story usually starts for me, with a question. So here's a question I have for all of you. If I asked you what your relationship with salmon is, 
what would you say? And what kind of a question is that? What is your relationship with salmon? Well, it's the question that compelled me to go to Alaska and to show up at the homes, boats, and fish camps of complete strangers. I was intrigued that there's still a place in this world where the lives of people and salmon are linked. And I wanted to know, what are the lives of people like who have relationships with these remarkable fish? So after several years of asking Alaskans this question, I came back with the stories and photographs that you'll find in my book, uh, The Salmon Way. And I'll highlight just a few of them here today. And at some point, I encourage you to get a hold of a copy of the book, whether you buy the book, whether you borrow it from the library, um, because there's so many more stories um, in the book than I'm going to have time to share with you today. And they're all very, very heartfelt. And I'm very grateful to the people uh, who opened their homes and their hearts to me, and they've allowed me to share their stories uh, with all of you. So where to start? Well, here's a rather mind-boggling map of Alaska that documents close to 20,000 streams, rivers, and lakes, shown here in blue, where you can find salmon. Now, keep in mind that this number is believed to represent only a fraction of the waters actually used by salmon. These are the ones that have just been officially documented, but there are many, many more. And keep in mind, for those of you who don't live in Alaska, Alaska is enormous. It is more than twice the size of the state of Texas. Texas is the second largest state in the United States. So I'd like to point out just a few places that I'll be talking about today so that you can orient yourself. So Bristol Bay uh, in Southwest Alaska. So all the rivers, streams, lakes that drain into Bristol Bay, um, they comprise an area about the size of the state of Kentucky. Uh, down here, Southeast Alaska, the land mass in Southeast um, is about the size of the state of West Virginia. And Southeast Alaska contains uh, very important transboundary rivers. You can see there the Taku, the Stikine, and the Eunuch. Uh, and when I say transboundary, what I mean by that is that they originate, their headwaters are in Canada, in this case they're in British Columbia, and they drain into the United States uh, through Alaska. And then over here, the Yukon and the Kuskokwim rivers, they drain into what's called the Yukon Kuskokwim River Delta, sometimes called the YK uh, Delta. This is one of the world's largest river deltas. The delta alone uh, is about the size of the state of Louisiana. It's also important to note that the Yukon River, it is the third longest river in North America. It's 2,000 miles long. And it's also a transboundary river originating in Canada draining uh, into uh, the United States through Alaska. Now, when I look at this map, what I see is a living landscape, a beating heart who, whose arteries of life are all of those blue waterways. Now, what you can't see on this map are the salmon pulsing through those waterways, bringing life to bears, birds, plants, people, and communities. Everywhere I went, Alaskans told me that salmon are their lifeblood. So for those of you who may not know, salmon uh, start their lives in fresh water. They head out to the ocean to mature, and if all goes well, they return to their freshwater birth streams as adults to spawn the next generation, and then they die. That is the life cycle of Pacific salmon. Now, in between the beginning and the end of their lives, a lot can happen. And at the end of their lives, they pass something on to the next generation, not unlike us. In between the beginning and end of our lives, a lot can happen. And what do we pass on? Can salmon teach us something about ourselves? So when you start poking your nose into people's relationships, you never know what you might learn. In the native village of Nepaimute, I poke my head inside the low doorway of a smokehouse. It's dim with a smoky haze, but the bright orange flesh of salmon illuminates and fills the space. Shelly Leary is hanging salmon strips on double hung racks. And she tells me, I was taught to always be ready to have food for the winter. I feel poor when I don't have food put up. When the smokehouse is filled, I feel good because I know I have enough. So it's mid-June and among the salmon's first, uh, the season's first salmon, 
And we speak in lowered voices that are respectful of the bounty before us. The aroma of smoked fish permeates my skin, my clothing, and the pleasure center of my brain. I feel a great sense of comfort in the smokehouse, and I'm not really sure why. Never having to think much about where my food comes from or the possibility of its scarcity, how could I begin to understand Shelley's feeling of well-being that comes with a full smokehouse? So we're on the Kuskokwim River, and we're 255 miles upstream from its mouth. The village population here of less than 100 is seasonal, with most people, including Shelley's family, arriving when the salmon do. The rest of the year, she lives downriver in Bethel, population 6,000, uh, accessible only by airplane or boat. And she tells me a story of when she was in Seattle for a few days. A friend from Alaska was with her and they walked around the big city looking at all the tall buildings and the crowds of people. And she says, we wondered what all those people would do when something bad happened. What would all of those people eat? We were glad we were going home soon. This is home for Shelly. So that's the difference between my and Shelly's comfort derived from her full smokehouse. Mine is immediate gratification, delicious food in a warm place right now. Hers is long-term security, food for the winter, like money in the bank. I live under the delusion that there will always be food, even though I am not growing, fishing, hunting, or even really storing much of it. Shelley lives under no such pretense. Who is the wiser? Who is rich? What is wealth? So Shelley is Inglic. She's Alaska native, and she and her family are among the 18% of Alaskans considered subsistence users of Alaska's fish and wildlife. And for thousands of years, Alaska natives have fished, hunted, and gathered as a way of life. Today, approximately 130,000 rural residents, both natives and non-natives, still rely on fish and wildlife, harvesting on average close to 300 pounds per person a year. And fish account for more than half of this amount. It's really important to note that there is no other place in the United States wild and abundant enough that a significant number of people can still live this way. Now, most of us are thousands of years removed from the ways of our hunter-gatherer ancestors. So today's concept of subsistence in Alaska, it's often misunderstood. The word itself implies a meager existence, but Alaskans who live this way of life all told me that they consider themselves rich people and they fight hard to maintain the right to continue their customary and traditional ways. Now, an outsider like me, I, I could see this as a food security issue, but I've come to learn that it is much more than that. It's about people whose identities, cultures, and connections to the land, waters, their ancestors, elders, children, and each other revolve around fishing, hunting, gathering, sharing, and respecting food and where it comes from, <clears throat> and teaching the next generations to do the same. Salmon bring people together. They keep people together. Three generations of this family gather at their fish camp on the Cuscoquam River. So let's meet another family. This is Heather's family uh, from Juneau in Southeast Alaska, and whose three generations are gathering here because of salmon. So Heather, you met her earlier, but she's in the middle uh, wearing the yellow suspenders. And Heather tells me that her fondest childhood memory uh, is riding in a skiff in the long twilight of an Alaska summer evening. With salt spray and the smell of spruce trees in the air, the boat whisked her to see spawning salmon near the Taku River. And she says, I'll never forget the joy I felt dragging my hands through the water, touching the backs of all those beautiful fish as sheer granite peaks towered over us. So Heather's parents, Pete and Sheila, they are sitting there on the left. They fished the Taku River and they sold salmon commercially in the summers. And they brought young Heather, her brother, and the family dog along on the boat, uh, named for Heather, named the Heather Ann. And Heather tells me that she grew up eating salmon every day in every way. So baked, boiled, and burgers, salads, and even salmon pie. 
And it wasn't until she left Alaska to attend college uh, in North Carolina that she fully appreciated the abundance of salmon that still exists in her home state and the way of life it allows commercial fishermen to live. Uh, Heather's husband, Kirk, is sitting in front of her with their daughter, Kelly. Uh, he's an ocean and seafood lover from Northern California. And Kirk grew up in a culture that revolves around high quality, locally produced cuisine. So when he began to fish commercially with Heather's dad, he quickly saw the potential to bring superb fish directly to restaurants, specialty markets, and consumers who wanted that direct connection um, with their food and the fishermen. So together with two friends, Renee and Winston, they're on the right there with their daughter, Athena, they form Taku River Reds. This is a company that prides itself on honoring both the fish and the fishermen by providing high quality wild Alaska salmon and supporting a way of life for fishing families. Uh, Heather, uh, she now advises a, an international coalition, it's called Salmon Beyond Borders, that works to conserve her home stream, the Taku River, along with other transboundary salmon rivers that straddle the United States-Canada border. This is the mouth of the Stikine River. Um, this is near the little town of Wrangell uh, in Southeast Alaska. And Heather says, these rivers are our lifeblood. My dad has always said to evaluate any proposed activity or development through the lens of salmon. Whatever is good for salmon is going to be good for the environment, community, and economy. Now, I've been very fortunate to spend time with Heather's family, sharing delicious salmon, laughter, and hopes for the future. Grateful for the life that salmon have given them, Heather and Kirk are raising their daughter, Kelly on salmon every day in every way. And in the long twilight of summer near the Taku River, they ride by skiff to the place where the salmon and their family have always gathered. So for thousands of years, people have always gathered where there are salmon. In Bristol Bay in Southwest Alaska, the annual return of the world's largest run of sockeye salmon triggered a great migration of native people who came for the seasonal bounty and to renew ties with family and friends. Today, the migration of both salmon and people continues in Bristol Bay, home for the past century to a thriving commercial fishery. People come for the seasonal bounty and to renew ties with family and friends. So Melanie Brown, who you met earlier, she's on the left there in red. Uh, she's migrated with her family to Bristol Bay every one of her 50 summers. Melanie is Alaska native. Her ancestors are Yupik, Aleut, and Inupiaq. And she inherited her great grandfather's commercial fishing site near the Naknek River. This is one of nine rivers that feeds into Bristol Bay. Now, there are two ways to commercial fish in Bristol Bay, set netting and drift netting. And Melanie is a set netter. So set netters, they fish close to shore from a fixed location, and many of them use skiffs to, to help them pull in the net and, and store uh, the salmon. Drift netters, they use bigger boats, and they can fish anywhere within the legal boundaries. Now, some set netters, they don't use boats at all, and they fish from the beach. And as one beach set netter told me, most of the time, it's plain, hard, miserable work in the cold, in the wind, in the rough waters, in the rain, in the mud, with bugs, little sleep, and improper nourishment for days on end. So the Bristol Bay fishery is incredibly intense. Why? Well, an enormous volume of salmon pulses into the bay in a short period of time. Since the 1960s, an average of 33 million fish return every year. In the season I visited, close to 60 million fish, six zero uh, return. Now most salmon runs in Alaska happen over the course of about four to six weeks, but here in Bristol Bay, 80 to 90% of that run comes in just 20 days. And with salmon showing up in mass and limited hours to catch them, uh, it's all hands on deck and sleep isn't something that one can afford to do much of. Uh, for Melanie uh, in the middle there, uh, commercial fishing in Bristol Bay, it's a business, but it's rooted in family. Her dad captains his own drift boat, her sister's family fishes their own set net site, and Melanie and her mother, and her mother's there on the left, and her mother, Catherine, is in her 70s. 
Uh, they fished their two set net sites together uh, from Melanie Skeff. And Melanie's daughter, Mari, she's on the right there, um, she started fishing the season I visited and she was 14 uh, at the time. And Melanie tells me, I feel like I'm living a legacy, a continuation of a river flowing in time. The Natmac is my family's home stream and I'm grateful that it has given us life for so long. I want that to continue for my children and their descendants. So I spent a day on Melanie Skiff watching just how physically demanding set netting can be. Everything is muscle powered on Melanie's boat and there's no mechanical gear, you know, helping to bring in that net. So you set, you pull, you pick the net, you repeat this for six to eight hours. You try to get some rest in between fishing openings and then you do it all again, the next tide and the next until the season ends. So at the end of the day, uh, Melanie invites me to the family home uh, for a dinner of moose spaghetti and birthday cake for her eight-year-old son, Oliver, who's uh, on the lower right corner there. And I ask the family, I ask everyone, what does salmon mean to you? Well, the answers come rapid fire. Food, home, family, opportunity, education, blessing, and work ethic. And Melanie tells me that when she was young, she started asking fundamental questions. I think questions we all start asking at some point. You know, uh, what's the meaning of life? Why are we here? And she says, there are certain events that mark our lives. And at the end, that's it. But there's the hope that we're passing something on too. You look at salmon and how much they pass on, not only to their offspring, but to the whole system that they're a part of and benefit. And I think a human who has lived life well does that too. So we've seen how salmon benefit people who catch and sell them for their livelihood and people who rely on them for a substantial part of their diet uh, as well as their culture. They also benefit people who make a living as sport fishing guides. John Yeager, he's on the right, uh, he lives in Wrangell near the mouth of the transboundary Stikeen River uh, in Southeast Alaska. And he takes people on his boat to fish for salmon in the ocean. And he says, I'm not so much trying to fill the freezers of my clients, I'm trying to fill their minds with memories. There are many firsts on my boat. First time in Alaska, first time catching a salmon, or first time fishing with a grandchild. I like that I can provide experiences that will stay with people forever. So John grew up in a small town in Ohio and his family owned a grocery store. And he tells me that when he was young, if he wanted ice cream or T-bone steaks, he'd just go to the family store and grab what he needed. There was no exchange of money. He never really understood where food came from or what it took to get it. But when he came to Alaska, he married into a family that homesteaded on the Stikeen River and fishes and hunts as a way of life. And he says, Living the way we do in Alaska, I think a lot about food, especially salmon. When my family catches a salmon, we give some to my wife's parents and to an elderly neighbor, and then we share the rest together. We've done the job the fish wanted us to do with it. That's important. It's not just the sustenance of the fish, it's the spirit of the fish. Heidi Wild, she's shown here with her 14-year-old son, Lane. Heidi's a sport fishing guide in Bristol Bay. She takes clients all over this immense region to fish for salmon and trout. And she guides March through October. And so she sees salmon at both the beginning and the end of their lives. And she says, the moment that salmon eggs hatch, the fight to survive and thrive is on. The fish make their way to the ocean and they face limitless perils. They stay gone until they're called home. They don't quit swimming in the middle of their return home simply because they face obstacles. They keep moving forward, tirelessly, devoted, inspiring, just like most of us. Heidi, myself, and two others, we fly in a small float plane soaring over the vast tundra with its countless creeks, lakes, and rivers. It's late August, and while the frenzy of the Bristol Bay commercial fishing season for people ended in mid-July, the frenzy of the spawning season for salmon is in full swing in the many tributaries upstream from the mouth of the bay. The pilot lands on a lake and we hike to a creek jammed with tomato red sockeye nearing the end of their lives. But we are not here for the salmon. We are here because of salmon. 
Rainbow and Dolly Varden trout grow big and fat here, feasting on salmon eggs, salmon carcasses, and young salmon that emerge in the spring. So we cross the creek and a wall of crimson sockeye opens and streams along both sides of us. The water sings with the riffles of the shallows and the ripples of the salmon swaying in the current. We cast into the water, into our minds, fishing for whatever this way comes. Few words are exchanged. The shared connection to the land, the fish, and the crisp air bonds us together better than words ever could. Time slows. What matters is what's happening now. Not what happened years ago or what might happen tomorrow. Heidi peers toward the bank of the creek and she says, is that a bear? My inner calm is disrupted by her voice, but all that matters is what's happening now. And what's happening now is that a bear has come between our group. Not an ideal scenario, and it's one that we've been so careful to avoid most of the day, but here he is. So he creeps into the creek and he turns broadside to us. This is a polite and very effective way of intimidating his neighbors by showing us his size. So we give the bear space and he ambles upstream a little ways, he stops and he turns broadside again. I think he's telling us that maybe we've overstayed our welcome uh, in his dining room. So we clump together and we splash across the creek. Salmon bodies thrash against our legs, our boots hit dry ground, and we begin to scramble up a steep bank, bashing through a wall of willows. Finally, we reach the top. And then the laughter begins. Laughter at the bushwhack up the bank, laughter at ourselves for fleeing the scene, and laughter because it's exhilarating to be in this staggeringly beautiful place, sharing this world-class moment with new friends. So bear and salmon go together, and so do many other species that salmon benefit. At every stage of their life cycle, salmon are a life force that feeds something. The salmon circle of life radiates to support at least 50 different species in Alaska. You spend enough time around salmon and you realize that they're in everything. They're in bears, birds, marine mammals, and people. They're even in trees. And I hope you're scratching your heads and you're asking, well, how does this happen? So is this salmon in the trees? Well, technically, this is salmon up a tree. So how the heck does salmon get in the trees? Well, in the great salmon forests of Southeast Alaska, scientists have found high concentrations of a nitrogen variant in trees near salmon streams. This variant, it's called nitrogen 15, and it comes from the ocean. So how did it find its way from the sea into the forest? Well, it swam there in the bodies of spawning salmon loaded with marine nutrients from their time at sea. But how exactly does it get into the trees? Well, bears have a lot to do with this. Now, bears don't particularly like being around other bears. So when they catch a fish, they will often carry it away from the stream and into the woods. Turns out that bears can move a lot of salmon into the forest. Researchers say that one bear can carry 40 fish from a stream in just eight hours. But toward the end of a good salmon season, the bears can afford to be picky and they're usually targeting just the richest parts of the fish and they leave the rest behind. Other animals then scavenge on these carcasses and this spreads the nutrients farther throughout the forest. Well, guess what happens? All of this rich fish fertilizer decomposes into the soil and the trees and other vegetation then absorb it through their roots. Scientists have actually traced nitrogen 15 in trees near salmon streams that they can link directly back to the fish. And that is how salmon end up in the trees. How cool is that? It's so cool, I did an entire book on this topic called, what else? Salmon in the trees. Now for this book, The Salmon Way, a lot of people have asked me how I made this cover photo. Uh, most people who don't know salmon, maybe haven't been around bears, they're pretty convinced that this is Photoshop, that this is not real. Um, this is not Photoshop, this is the real deal. Um, so how did this come about? Well, I had this idea in my mind that I wanted to make a photograph that spoke to the concept of salmon as a life force. But this is difficult to capture and show when the salmon are still alive. And so somehow I needed to make a photograph of a live, vibrant salmon providing life for something else. 
And to do this, I went to McNeil River. This is on the northeast side of the Alaska Peninsula. And there's a story in the book uh, about my time here. It's called True Nature. And I'd like to read um, just a part of it to you uh, now. Weighing more than half a ton, a bear named Rocky ambles toward me. He has scars on his face and shoulders and tattered skin on his sides. He's a fighter, hence his name, and he's healthy. His belly almost scrapes the ground. His enormous head melds into his massive girth, and each paw is bigger than my head. He's hungry. Fortunately for Rocky and me, there's a river full of fish just steps from where he stands and I sit at the McNeil River State Game Sanctuary. Established in 1967, 200 square mile sanctuaries, protected wildlife habitat, and home to the world's largest congregation of brown bears, also called Ursus arctos. As many as 144 individuals have been identified in a single summer with 74 bears observed at one time. From early July through mid-August, chum salmon returned to the McNeil River to spawn. A mile upstream from the river's mouth, the McNeil River Falls create a salmon traffic jam, providing excellent fishing opportunities for bears and outstanding bear viewing experiences for humans. That's why I'm here, along with nine other lucky homo sapiens who won four-day bear viewing permits and a lottery system through the Alaska Department of Fish and Game. If it weren't for salmon, we wouldn't be here. If it weren't for salmon, people who came to McNeil long before it was designated a wildlife sanctuary probably wouldn't have been here either. The camp where we pitched our tents is pocked with shallow depressions in the ground. This is evidence of semi-subterranean dwellings of people who were most likely nomadic. I can envision them arriving in the summer to harvest salmon. Perhaps they took steam baths fueled by driftwood from the beach, not far from today's wood-fired sauna overlooking a lily pond. They would have shared food, chores, and laughter, not unlike us sharing peanut butter, hauling water, and swapping stories. And while they didn't come here to watch bears, they undoubtedly viewed them with respect. Everything we do, eat, sleep, walk, and talk, is done with respect for the bears and their homes. We sit quietly near the roaring river. Rocky faces the falls in solid defiance of the oncoming water tumbling over the boulders and swirling past his legs. He darts his head into the churning water and emerges triumphant with a flopping fish. It's a female, and as the clamp of the big Bruin's teeth forces the eggs from her body, in that moment, her life force is transferred to his. Watching the age-old scene of predator pursuing prey in a setting devoid of roads, motorized vehicles, crowds of people, or cell phone coverage triggers something deep within us. That wild part of our DNA, long dormant, awakens from its domesticated slumber. Places like the McNeil Sanctuary make us feel alive, not because we're seeking a thrill, but because what we didn't know we were missing reintroduces itself. Connecting to our true nature makes us whole. So I think that many people, I know that I am, um, are drawn to salmon because in salmon we see ourselves. Salmon show all who encounter them that life is a dance of rhythms, balance, and strength. Through twists and turns, ups and downs, we learn to trust the unseen and bow with grace for the time we are here. From the fish we learn what it means to be a part of the world what it means to be human, and what it means to just be. Salmon are a gift. I heard that over and over again from Alaskans. They are a gift to the land, water, animals, plants, and people. And when you're on the receiving end of a gift, you give thanks and you give back. It's the salmon way. Everywhere I went from remote villages to urban cities, whether I met with people for 10 minutes or 10 days, I always seem to leave with salmon in my hands. I was so touched by the generosity that the salmon people showed me. I learned that sharing is the Alaska way and that it goes beyond food and includes sharing things like firewood, laughter, sweat, and tears. This generosity of spirit forges relationships and relationships create communities. Throughout my travels, I asked people another question. I asked, what would your life be like without salmon? 
pretty much everyone gave me the same answer. Without salmon, there would be no community. That's what salmon do. They connect us to each other, to a home stream, and to our true nature. Emma Lakaita, she's a young commercial fisherman from Homer. And uh, you may, some of you Alaskans may know her. She and her sister Claire uh, um, uh, formed a company called Salmon Sisters, uh, very popular among Alaskans. And she tells me, Salmon have given all Alaskans a common language, a set of values, something to believe in and hope for. Reuben Hastings, he's a young Alaska native sport fishing guide from Bristol Bay, and he says, watching salmon, you see that life isn't just a straight line that ends at the finish line. Both Emma and Reuben hope that their generation and beyond can continue the salmon way of life. Now, for many Alaskans who don't make their living uh, from selling salmon or live a subsistence way of life, their connection to salmon runs deep, catching their own fish and sharing the bounty with others because food always tastes best when it's shared. Now, I wish more than anything that I could live this salmon way of life where I live in Washington State. Now, when I look at this map, I feel both pain and hope. Now, much of the hope lies north in Alaska, but let's talk about the pain first. The once staggering runs of salmon in Northern California, Oregon, Washington, Idaho, and southern British Columbia are now less than just 10% of their historical abundance. How did this happen? Well, beginning in the late 1700s, an increasingly industrial way of life systematically decimated salmon and their habitat, creek by creek, river by river, watershed by watershed. A culture that valued short-term profits and commodities dominated cultures that valued long-term relationships with their natural communities damming rivers to power factories and energy grids, dumping toxic waste into the waterways, diverting water from rivers to irrigate crops, overfishing and deforestation are just a handful of the crimes against salmon that led to their demise. Now, plenty of people objected to this, but the voices of those who stood for salmon were steamrolled in the name of progress. Now, when the salmon vanished, entire ways of life went with them. The gift of salmon was gone and the relationships, communities, and cultures were lost. So this is the Columbia River. This is 66 miles from its mouth along the border of Washington and Oregon. The 1200 mile Columbia River, this was once one of the greatest salmon producing systems on earth. And like many of the lower 48 rivers where salmon once thrived, we lost salmon in the Columbia due to things like overharvest habitat destruction, hydroelectric dams, and substituting hatcheries for habitat. At 146 miles from the mouth of the Columbia is the Bonneville Dam. This is the first of many uh, built on this river system. And now at the dam's visitor center, uh, there's an exhibit that talks about dam construction and, and what it brought to the region. And there's one sign in the exhibit in particular that, that really stands out to me. What is wealth, living, and happiness? And who decides? The native people whose entire way of life was connected to this free-flowing river, who gathered for millennia for the seasonal bounty of salmon and to renew ties with family and friends. How would they define wealth, living, and happiness? When we overfished, dammed, and polluted the mighty Columbia, we traded one form of wealth for another. We traded a way of life for another. Now, I won't argue there are things that we may have gained and there are things that we did gain when we did this, but we also lost. A river without its salmon is a river without its soul. And this story has repeated itself most everywhere in the world where there were once salmon on both sides of the Pacific and Atlantic oceans. Now, let's talk about hope. You've seen how the salmon people of Alaska define wealth, living, and happiness. A full smokehouse, a connection to a home stream and community, gathering with family and friends, sharing the seasonal bounty, and passing all of this to the next generations. There's a strong belief among Alaska natives that if they respect the salmon, the fish will come back every year and give themselves to the people. 
I think that's the basis for any healthy relationship, respect. If we want these salmon relationships to continue, we have to continue to respect the salmon and give them what they need. Clean, cool, healthy, fresh water to spawn and rear and a thriving ocean to mature. So I'd like to highlight uh, just a couple people who are working to ensure that salmon have a future uh, in Alaska. Sue Mogger, she's a stream ecologist and the science director for Cook Inlet Keeper. This is an organization that works to conserve the Cook Inlet watershed and the life it supports uh, in Alaska. And in 2008, Sue and the Cook Inlet uh, Keeper, they coordinated a team of state and federal agencies as well as nonprofit and community groups to create and implement a stream temperature monitoring network in the Cook Inlet watershed. And they've, um, Sue is helping to expand that um, to the Bristol Bay watershed and other places as well. Uh, as cold-blooded creatures, uh, salmon depend on the water temperature of their environment for the regulation of their body temperature. And Sue helped me to understand what happens to the fish when water temperatures rise, uh, something that occurred this summer in Alaska with record temperatures throughout the state, and something we might see uh, more of in the future with the changing climate. So she told me that water temperatures above 55 degrees Fahrenheit bring increasing stress to salmon. Above 68 degrees, the fish are less likely to avoid predators and successfully spawn, and at 77 degrees and higher, they don't have the energy to spawn and survive the freshwater phase of their life. And there were streams in the state this summer that were well over 77 degrees. So understanding which stream systems across a landscape are prone to warming and which are likely to remain unchanged will help land managers prioritize our conservation strategies in order to increase the resiliency of salmon to a changing climate. This is absolutely critical work, and there was not a lot of this being done prior uh, to Sue initiating this uh, in 2008. So they're, they're able to gather a baseline now, um, which will help them <clears throat> make uh, decisions going forward. Uh, Ted Otis, he's on the left. He's a research biologist with the Alaska Department of Fish and Game. And I spent time with uh, Ted and other folks uh, within the department to get an idea of um, what they do to manage salmon. I, you know, I, how do you manage salmon? I had no idea. And I learned just how much information and data is behind any decision to allow or restrict fishing, things like fish forecasts, test fisheries, escapement reports, genetic analyses, historical re records, and, and much more. And Ted helped me understand that Alaska still has abundant salmon runs, due in part largely because the habitat remains intact. And he also stressed how important genetic diversity is to salmon. And he cited Bristol Bay as a great example of diverse salmon habitat that fosters stability within and across salmon populations, making them more resistant to environmental change. And I have to say the time I spent throughout the state with the men and women of Fish and Game made me realize that they often work in challenging conditions and sometimes uh, quite dangerous. And it can be quite a thankless job at times, uh, but everyone I met who worked with the department was quite passionate about making sure that Alaska is a place where there will always be salmon uh, to catch. And in fact, uh, Alaska is one of the few places left in the world where salmon can still thrive, where salmon people live connected to the fish with an appreciation for what nourishes both body and spirit. And while I set out to tell stories in my book that celebrate the salmon way, there is also a cautionary tale to tell. And I had many conversations with people uh, about their concerns and their worries um, uh, for the future. You know, would there be enough salmon? Would their children be able to live um, the salmon way? So this does weigh heavily uh, on people's minds. Um, so what are threats to salmon in Alaska? Well, Bristol Bay, home to the world's largest run of sockeye salmon. This is threatened by the proposed pebble mine. If built, it will be the world's largest open pit gold mine situated at the headwaters of two of the most important rivers that feed Bristol Bay. Those transboundary rivers in Southeast Alaska, they're threatened by pollution uh, from current and proposed Canadian mining operations. And in some parts of the state, um, there are salmon runs that are in decline. Uh, including those of the Kuskokwim and Yukon rivers. 
And there are always new proposals to dam, dredge, and degrade more salmon habitat, including building new roads uh, in the Tongass National Forest in Southeast Alaska. But here's the good news. Alaska is a place where history doesn't have to repeat itself. This is really one of my primary motivations for pursuing this book. There's still time here to get it right. This is a place where salmon still endure and where we have an incredible opportunity to leave a salmon-filled legacy. And throughout my travels, I asked everyone I met how he or she values salmon. Not a single person responded with financial figures. Instead, all of the answers spoke to the relationship instead of the resource. And it didn't matter if the people I asked the question to fish for their food, their livelihood, or for fun. Everyone gave me the same answers. Family, community, culture, well-being, and way of life. Values too precious to reduce to dollars and cents and senseless to try. So to me, the message was loud and clear. The true value of salmon, priceless. So today, it's worth celebrating and defending that Alaska is still a place where salmon are the lifeblood, where the salmon way is still a way of life. And so I dedicate this talk and my book to the salmon people. May your lives always pulse with the beauty and mystery of your home streams. And to the salmon, may you always come home. And to all of you, I leave you with the greatest lesson that salmon have taught me. Life short, be a life force with the time you're given and give it everything you've got. Thank you. Thank you, Amy. Let's take a moment here and uh, soak that in. And uh, Amy, just uh, want to, uh, because everyone else seems to be on mute, um, offer my own enthusiastic thanks. Um, I feel fed. Thank you so much for your incredible hard work that went into this book. Uh, the passion that comes out of every pore uh, that is so apparent and for, for your time tonight, for sharing this with us. Thank you so very much. My pleasure. You're welcome. <laughs> I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get out of the way here and uh, um, I'd like to open this up here to uh, uh, our panel. Uh, that would be Amy, Heather and Melanie, um, all folks that live the salmon way of life. And um, I am virtually certain that there, there are questions here uh, throughout the board. So um, let's, let's do this. Um, Tyler, if you want to help organize this vis-a-vis, -vis, um, <laughs> I want Amy to narrate my life. Yeah, me too. Um, <laughs> if you know how to work the, the raise your hand function, and, and here's, here's how I know how to do it. You hit the participants button on the bottom, and then there should be uh, a little a little thing that says uh, raise your hand. If you if you know how to do that, great. Or just go ahead and type a chat uh, a question into the chat bar. Or you can just kind of gesticulate wildly on the screen too. That's fine. So um, however we'd like to we'd like to be of service to you. So any let's just start it right right up with uh, with with any questions, and then we'll kind of interweave some um, thoughts from Heather and Melanie as well. Um, okay, so no, no one's just jumping right out of the, the shoots here. So, um, Heather, I w I'd like to start with you and, and just ask you, um, what's it like seeing your family chronicled that way in such a beautiful, uh, lasting, uh, meaningful way? And I think you're on mute. There you go. Yeah, gosh. Well, thank you, Mark. Um, um. I'm sitting here feeling quite emotional, honestly, right? Because um, first of all, it's it's you, Mark, it's Melanie, and it's Amy, and you've all been such long-term life friends, and Salmon did bring us together, obviously, and um, I'm just so grateful to Amy and to you, Mark, in particular, as, as artists who, especially in this time, also in the pandemic, um, who are giving us a way of enjoying and celebrating and um, honoring the lives that um, 
folks like my family and me have been lucky enough to lead. And so, yes, it's really emotional, honestly. And I know it's meant so much to my family, Amy, and our extended family that were a part of your book. And um, because I no longer live year round in um, Southeast Alaska, and we're now where my husband is from, um, the land of the Pomo and the Miwok um, on the, the banks of the Russian River, the other end of the Salmon Coast, um, I'm especially missing. I'm, I'm missing Southeast Alaska right now. So I'm grateful I have the book just to open up and, and remember. Um, and you've so captured the spirit of all of us that you've profiled. So thank you, Amy. You're welcome. Yeah, I don't, it's the word that doesn't get used a lot these days, but I, I swooned when I saw <laughs> the, the images from Southeast and the, the mist in the trees and the island and the, I, I could smell the spray you were talking about, you know, when you were talking about Heather on the, on the skiff. Um, and, you know, similarly with, with Bristol Bay, just that feeling of, um, you know, I, I've had the great fortune of being able to, to pick some fish, you know, um, and, uh, and understand, you know, there, that kind of work that goes into that is just backbreaking and uh, in, incredibly hard, but incredibly gratifying. And Melanie, um, birthday woman extraordinaire, can you tell us a little bit about um, what that feels like to um, to bring food to people from the you know fruits of your labor and being a fifth generation person to do that. Um, I don't know. I, I guess the first thing that comes to mind um, is the way I feel at the end of the season. I feel kind of uh, <laughs> until I've had a chance to get some sleep. You know, like sleep that it is the length of time that a person should get. Um, my body feels kind of broken. <laughs> Um, but once I start getting, you know, like once our, um, operation and, and our, our gear are put away, I start to recognize how much shine I have inside of myself. <laughs> it's, I, um, I feel like there's this, this almost like a, a fish fire that's sort of radiating outward from me. Um, it, I, it, it's it's a funny thing. It just um, I don't know. It's like this this wild energetic thing that I get from moving through a season in Bristol Bay and like what it gives me and and I know it's not just me feeling it because I can tell when I come into contact with people when I'm feeling that that they see it too. <laughs> And, and it, it helps to feed the interaction that I have with them. Um, I know that's, that's a really kind of an intangible answer, but it's just, it's truly what I feel when I, um, when I finish a, a season of fishing. I remember um, both working in Bristol Bay and then also guiding and having that same kind of, that same kind of feeling, just a, a, a glow and a purpose um, and a satisfaction. Um, so I got two questions that come in here. Um, first of all, um, from Namaste, uh, Amy, what are the plans for this beautiful book? How can we help get the word out for people in our community about the book? Uh, well, um, well, uh, the website, um, uh, the salmonway.org, um, I, you can direct people there. Um, I think more important, you know, the, of course, tell everybody you know and buy it as gifts for everybody you know. I mean, you know, however you think it's best to get it out there. But I think more importantly, um, I, I made the book with the intention of um, having it hopefully be used in a way that would help to uh, protect um, where salmon live and uh, the ways of life um, that people, um, uh, that their lives revolve around salmon. And so I've been partnering, um, and I think this is, for me, this is the most effective way that the book can attempt to make a difference uh, in accomplishing those goals. So I've been partnering uh, with a terrific organization, uh, several, but um, Salmon State is one of them. Hi, Kielly. <laughs> uh, Salmon State uh, is one of them, and Melanie and Heather both work for Salmon State. Um, I saw that uh, Megan Barker, uh, you're here as well. Megan works for the Alaska chapter of Trout Unlimited. 
Um, these are fantastic organizations that are working really, really hard um, to protect Bristol Bay from the Pebble Mine, to protect the, the Transboundary Rivers in Southeast Alaska, um, really wherever else salmon are threatened. Um, they're the ones really doing the heavy lifting, um, you know, doing the organizing, doing what needs to be done to uh, uh, try and safeguard the habitat. I always say I kind of have the fun job. I get to be the cheerleader and, and uh, you know, say rah-rah for all these fantastic places and, and the people, um, which again, I love doing. Um, but again, I really want the book to be used in that way. And um, so I would encourage you all to um, you know, check out Salmon State's uh, website, salmonstate.org, uh, Trout Unlimited uh, as well. Um, uh, check out their work, support their work if you can uh, in any way. Um, these battles, I, I you know, it, it's just amazing to me where you know, you saw on that map how diminished, um, you know, Pacific salmon habitat is, and that Alaska really is like the last best place in the world, you know, for salmon. And yet the threats to salmon in Alaska are bigger than they have ever been. I mean, ever. Just the, the scale of uh, proposals, you know, whether it's mining or, or logging or whatever it is, um, are just bigger than, you know, we've ever seen in our, in our lifetime. So again, big, big thanks to, uh, uh, Megan and um, Melanie and Heather and Mark. Uh, for those of you on board that don't know Mark, Mark is a filmmaker. Uh, he's done one, uh, two films now, one called The Breach. The second uh, is The Wild, and the, the Wild is the new one. It's all about Bristol Bay. Um, so again, I encourage you to watch those films. I know it's a really long-winded answer here, but um, <laughs> um, the, <laughs> the, the, the great thing again about partnering and there's really no other way we can do this work right than collaborating to you know with each other and and uh, uh, Melanie and uh, Heather and I we've been to Washington DC together you know we, we did a big event in the fall um, with the US Congressional Wild Salmon Caucus uh, Alaska Senator Lisa Murkowski spoke as did other representatives we were able to get the book in all of their hands. So that's really how I like to see that book get used um, is to get it in front of decision makers, you know, because these are the people who have the power and the influence to um, stop, you know, things like Pebble Mine or, you know, say, yeah, go ahead and do this. So um, again, that, that's how I'm, so I get the more the book gets out there, then you know, the more people are aware. Um, but again, I can't really, I, I can't even attempt to make a drop of difference without the good work that, um, that these great organizations are doing. Amy, awesome. Um, couple, two, two quick bullet points and then a couple questions. Um, so first of all, uh, from uh, Helen, Amy's publisher, uh, they're offering a 25% discount on the Salmon Way. And Wow, all your books across the board um, at mountaineers.org books. And then also I've put the other links we've been talking about up in the chat bar. You just kind of uh, copy and paste them into your into your um, browser bar. Uh, we've got for the salmonway.org, salmonstate.org, which is who uh, Melanie and Heather work for. And then savebristolbay.org is um, actually Megan is uh, associated with TU, and that's the org that's um, – working uh, behind the scenes with uh, TU on the Save Bristol Bay campaign. Um, also, two questions here. This is a this is kind of heavy duty because uh, I feel this a lot myself. Um, uh, and, and I'm going to just put it to, to our panel here, to the three of you. What feelings come up when you consider life without salmon? Uh, and Drew, um, and Drew, I'm going to get to you in a second. But uh, I, he says, I know that it's something that keeps me up at night. It sure does with me, too. Uh, it, it, it's, it's a haunting thing. Um, we talk about it in the wild. Uh, the thought of rivers without you continually haunts me. Um, we have a chance to get it right right now. So um, what, what feelings come up for, for you three? And we'll start with you, Heather. Contemplating life without salmon. Um, my friend recently used the phrase calculating the incalculable and I can't even pronounce the word, but, um, but it's something that I can't currently imagine um, or couldn't, I should say. Um, we moved to Northern California um, a year and a half ago to spend the, the winters here and to, to be with my husband's family. And so like Amy, I now live in a place um, that once was rich with salmon, 
where you could walk across their backs. Um, and that has gone. Um, they're in a place now where there's a lot of important restoration work happening um, and honoring of once what was once here and now with um, agriculture, wines, um, cannabis, organic um, produce farming, a lot of those practices are in honor of um, there being salmon here um, and once larger numbers. And so um, not using uh, pesticides, for example, is, is um, having a big impact in this area. But I guess it's just interesting to be in a place that was once rich with wild salmon and isn't now. And um, it's that whole shifting baselines um, theory or what does take place um, where if you don't know what was once here, you don't know what you're missing. Um, and so I feel like it's a real privilege for me um, to be based here part of the year and to still um, have my work focused on saving what we do have in Southeast Alaska in this case, but also just making people realize um, that there's a lot we can do um, that um, I, I am hopeful, right? As more people have a connection or just realize um, what is here and what was lost, but also, as you said, Mark, what we have a chance to still ensure stays around for generations and generations. And that is what we do currently have in Alaska and also parts of British Columbia. Um, and people in the lower 48 have a big role to play um, in not only continuing to support restoration efforts where they are, but to support our work um, and to purchase wild salmon um, sort of you know, that whole, whole adage of save a wild salmon, eat one. So purchase wild Alaska salmon, show that you value uh, the land being left in a state um, that they can thrive. Um, um, so I guess that's another long-winded answer to your question, Mark, but um, I can't conceive of not having wild salmon where I'm from and where my heart home is. Um, and yet also I can see the need to also celebrate the landscape as it is now and work as best we can uh, to make it habitable for wild salmon and also support these efforts that that are so needed um, in Alaska. As Amy said, the threats are greater than ever. So it's a real all hands on deck moment. Thanks, Heather. I, I'm going to combine a couple questions here. Uh, we've got a, a new one come in from um, from Collis, clear clear across the country on the East Coast. And I, I kind of want to combine the, the previous question, um, Melanie, for you, for as, as a Bristol Bay resident and a fifth generation fisherman, um, you know, with the prospect of the proposed pebble mine in the headwaters of the world's last fully intact wild salmon run. And, um, and also in, you know, with the, um, the, the prospect of, you know, this, this year, probably looking at another 50 million plus uh, sockeye returning. Um, and there, maybe there might, there might not be a, a, a fishing season this year due to COVID-19 and the, the, you know, very correctly um, being utterly cautious about the people that live there. Um, and, uh, you know, keeping the, this, this moment in time of, of um, what, what's at stake for this season, but then also in the bigger picture beyond with um, what, what's at risk if um, we let Bristol Bay turn into an industrial mining district. So how, how, does, that, how does that jive right now in the, in the zeitgeist and the feeling that you're, you're feeling right now? Uh, uh, well, I've been trying not, not to let COVID and the future of Bristol Bay commingle too much. Um, the, and the thought of not going to Bristol Bay this season, that's definitely not an easy thought to digest. Um, but I also recognize that lives are at stake and it's important to consider people's lives um, uh, because we can't continue to live our fish lives if, if we're, you know, putting each other's lives at risk. Um, but uh, in terms of uh, 
you know, like the salmon of Bristol Bay, I mean, not, not to discount other runs in other parts of the state, but there's no denying Bristol Bay is, it's the, the last gem. It's the last really great run that's uh, left on the planet of truly wild, wild salmon. Um, we all know that. Uh, but I, I've also heard my friend Sarah O'Neill refer to salmon as a bellwether. And right now the, the salmon in Bristol Bay are healthy, but the, it, you know, so it's like the health of salmon, um, they, they're an indicator of the health of our planet. But without the salmon being present at all, where does that leave us? I think that's a really important question that we all need to ask ourselves. And there are a lot of people that go so far as, um, you know, stating that without, once the salmon are gone, you know, the, so goes the health of the planet. Um, and and I, I think there's something to that. Um, you know, because of, of what salmon give, you know, back to the system um, with their bodies, uh, the nutrients in their bodies and their, their life cycle. And um, I think that this sort of last vestige of untouched earth that we have, you know, we have so much untrammeled earth and I think it's doing a lot to support our planet here in Alaska. And um, I mean, there are, there are people that are even uh, talking about how they think that COVID is sort of like the, I don't know, maybe we've even gone beyond it being sort of the warning cry or the warning signal of um, the capacity of our planet uh, being, being reached. And um, pandemics happen when, you know, we're not, we're not in balance with nature, when we're not in balance with the planet. Um, I kind of feel like maybe I've brought in too much, uh, <laughs> much more than you and you meant to ask me. Oh, no, it's, I'm it's not a, digressing too much. They're deep waters, um, but I'm delighted to see that we actually have some hands up here um, with some honest to God questions. So um, my friend Susan Hamer, uh, I'm going to unmute you and um, fire away. Oh, am I, oh, I just wanted to tell you how incredible this is. I mean, Mark, between your films and this uh, presentation, it's just so inspiring and uh, we have to do everything we can to save uh, Alaska and the fish and salmon. And it's just, it's just so inspiring. So thank you so much for doing this and so proud to be working with you on the film. It's hopefully we get to expose everybody to your film and also to this wonderful book uh, in, our, in our work. So thank you for doing this. Thank you, Susan. Thanks for being here tonight. Um, and uh, Eric, it looks like um, you have a question. Um, yes. Well, first of all, for those of you who aren't on the gallery view, I use the virtual uh, background to post pictures that I have. And if you want to check on the gallery view or check on me, I have a picture, one of my favorite pictures, of course, uh, Amy is a great mentor of mine. It shows just the vitality of one of the king salmon we catch. And what great, great creatures these salmon are. I mean, whether it's king salmon, or I'm going to post a picture right now of everything but a king salmon that actually came up on successive hooks on my line. And it just breaks my heart that we are losing these iconic creatures that are so good for our health and such a wonderful treat to eat. And I just, part of the reason I rose my hand is not because I had such a big question, but I really wanted to thank Amy for putting together this eclectic group of people in her book. <laughs> Melanie and Heather, who are right there right now, and I see uh, my old friend Nancy Lord is on the participants. These are great, great leaders in this state. And for her to put their thoughts together 
in this book. And the overriding thing, as she mentions, is their, their absolute love, not only for these great creatures, but for the land that nourishes them and the ocean that feeds them. It is, thank you so much, Amy and Melanie and all of those of you involved. And if you don't, you know, this virtual uh, background is really fun. I can post pictures of <laughs> all day. Thanks for those of you who don't know. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, all you're the first more than welcome. For those of you who don't know, uh, Eric Jordan, he's he is featured in the book. I was he's one of the very deep, heartfelt stories I wasn't able to talk about tonight. Uh, he is a commercial fisherman, a salmon troller, catches the salmon individually, hook and line. Um, Eric gave me a great gift uh, by asking me to come onto his boat and not just only observe what he was doing, but I actually was his crew member <laughs> for a few days. And uh, uh, oh, there's his wife. Is that Sarah? Yeah, there's his wife, Sarah. Um, for those of you who have never, you don't know commercial fishing or you do know commercial fishing, a brand new crew member who's never done this before is called a greenhorn. And um, I was so green, I mean, I was greener than Kermit the Frog. So <laughs> for him to ask me to come on the boat and crew with him was, um, that was a lot of trust and faith or I don't know, craziness uh, in you. But I learned more in the first two minutes of crewing on Eric's boat than I would have learned in an entire season of sitting on the boat watching him do it. So that was an incredible gift that you gave me. And, uh, and again, just gives me an, an a, whole new appreciation for what um, all fishermen, but particularly the, the ones that are making these salmon available to the rest of us to eat, you know, what you do and, you know, how dangerous it is and just how, how much work it is and, but how rewarding too. So thank you, Eric. Well, I just want to follow up if I could. Amy was super and I had envisioned her coming along and seeing what it's like and stuff. And she came along with the gal pictured here, Catherine Klusmeyer, who is a great writer in her own right, won all kinds of awards. And we landed right on the fish. I mean, instead of, you know, trolling, uh, fishing king salmon, a good day is 20. And a few days you get over 100. And coho is a good day is 100. And a few days in your life you may get three, 400. We were fishing chums, and we had five to 700 chums a day. And so Amy was thrown right into it, pulling fish, bleeding fish. She was just covered in blood and slime. And I won't show any of those pictures. <laughs> we did great, and it was so much fun. And we've become great friends since then. We visit every week. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for becoming such a great friend, Amy. Again, salmon bring people together. Salmon do bring people my, together. My deepest relationships, you know, today are all through salmon. I uh, I couldn't agree more, and I just wanted to um, give a quick shout out to another friend who's um, brought together by salmon. Um, Drew Hamilton has asked a couple questions here, and. Um, Drew, I'm going to put a, a, a link up right now. Um, Drew has been working um, on for years uh, with bears in McNeil River. And Drew, you want to give a little, uh, just a quick shout on what, what you're working on here? Yeah. So right now, hey, thank you everybody for, for letting me jump, jump in here to the salmon party. And uh, I'm going to hit Mark up for his uh, salmon uh, bon mi recipe. Uh, <laughs> got it. I got it. That sounded really stop me in my tracks. Um, but it was really great to see some of the bears of McNeil River featured in this book. I, I was like, I mean, I saw that picture flash on my screen as I was cooking dinner here. And I said, hey, that's Rocky. And uh, it's just these bears are, are so familiar. And we, we've been looking for ways to, um, to really stop this process. And, and the best way to do it right now, um, in my opinion, is with all this pandemic going on, the Army Corps of Engineers should not be working on this project. We need to stop the NEPA process until this pandemic is over. And so we've created this, uh, this link that Mark just posted. 
and it's super easy. You can go on and by putting in your zip code and contact information, it will send letters directly to your federal representatives. You can, you can type in your own words, but there are some words there. You can modify them. You can do whatever you want, but just implore, just demand. They work for you, remember? Demand that they step in and tell the Army Corps of Engineers to suspend this process, suspend the NEPA process until after um, the pandemic is over. You think about the folks that are out in Bristol Bay faced with these life changing decisions. Are we gonna open the fishery? How do we keep this virus out of our villages? Um, they're, they're not, they don't have time to comment to the Army Corps of Engineers as cooperating agencies. That copper's not going anywhere. Like two months, this process, you know, three months, just when this pandemic is over, we can start looking at these questions again, but everything just needs to stop and it needs to stop right now. And it's gonna take us com uh, commenting to our legislators to get that done. Drew, thank you so much. And uh, again, uh, the link is up, up defendbristolbay.com slash bears. It's up in the, the chat link. And Drew, um, can you tell us how we can see your bear film that we got? I got to see this week. It was fabulous. Yeah, actually I can uh, pull up. It'll take me just a second. And uh, thank goodness I have my webcam off so you can't see my messy house uh, while I'm doing this. But I'll just pull up the, uh, the link. Right. And it's, it's actually on YouTube, and we did a, we did a movie uh, called The Bears of Amactadori, where we went out to, um, to Amactadori, the proposed port site, and watched bears and, talks about, and we talked about how the bears move around the Alaska Peninsula and just some of the impact. And it's not designed to, we're not trying to take away from the fish argument. We're not trying to, to we're trying to complement and, and really highlight just how big this actually is like pebble in the film we, t we talk about it and when pebble says oh it's just a little spot on the map but when you look at it it's a 200 mile gash in the habitat from the kenai peninsula all the way to the other side of lake iliamna like it is it is ridiculous um it might take me a second to oh no there i got it cool. i'll copy the link and paste it in so um, and but it's another fun thing to to watch it takes about a the webinar is about an hour the film is about 15 minutes and you can uh you can fast forward uh, to the film if you don't want to hear me talk anymore. Well, it's just another example of how everything is connected in, in Bristol Bay and by salmon and, and it's, it is connected and it's a, it's just want to thank you for your work, Drew. It's, um, it's fantastic. You could join us tonight and we're good. We got just a couple minutes left. Um, I wanted to, uh, uh, acknowledge my friend Collis, um, who's on the East Coast, working with Slow Fish, and um, uh, there's an event coming up, and I don't see where you're at. And if you can unmute yourself, fantastic. But if you want to tell us about it real quick, Collis. Yeah, uh, thanks, Mark. Um, just a quick, quick piggyback on what Drew was saying. He's exactly right, and plus the movie's really cool. I saw it this this week too. Um, but what's happening in Bristol Bay right now is really frightening for the fishermen who are there and really con confusing and frightening to the fishermen that are outside of it. And to just to even think about Pebble Mine still moving ahead while they're trying to figure out how to safeguard the villages, it's tough. I mean, I had a conversation with a, a captain up there, Catherine Karskalen, good friend of mine and Mark's, and she's like, it's just, it's, everything's moving so fast. So it's, it, I, I encourage people to get involved, get to learn more about it. Um, <clears throat> what we're doing on June 5th is we're having a webinar. Slow Fish has been having a series of webinars, connecting people, building community around responsibly harvested seafood, uh, transparent, uh, trustworthy su seafood supply chains, and the people that are involved. And uh, Melanie was involved and she, played some wonderful music and the one that we had uh, last Friday. Um, and there's a recording of it that I just put up. The one that we're gonna have on June 5th is going to be about salmon. It's gonna be focused on salmon. We're gonna talk about Bristol Bay. We're gonna talk about some other fisheries on the West Coast. And uh, if we can get the right people lined up, maybe talk about some indigenous fishing on Atlantic salmon in, in Nova Scotia and, and New Brunswick. Um, and so it's again talking about the stories of the salmon people, so to speak, um, and invite you. Once we get more of that pulled together, we're still in the pro planning process. I'll get the information to Mark, and he can share it to everybody here. Fabulous. But again, the community building, all these stories. This is what we're trying to do. 
Thank you so much, Collis. And yeah, that, that's such great work you're doing out on the East Coast. And um, yeah, uh, as we start to wrap this up, you guys, in a minute, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put uh, a link up for you uh, to connect with us, to connect with me and the wild and the movement we're doing through the film. And uh, the newsletter that we send out once a week now, uh, we will post information about how to connect in these various ways. So as soon as Collis has that info, I'll get it, I'll get it out for you. Um, I want to toss it back to Amy and um, again, just put the uh, link up again for The Salmon Way. Um, if you don't uh, have the book, uh, I cannot more highly recommend it. It's gorgeous. It's, uh, it's obviously worth talking about and sharing with friends and family. Um, and, uh, you know, if you can support uh, Amy through the link there or your, your local book purveyors who, who certainly could use it right now in this difficult time, uh, that would be fantastic. Um, and Amy, just again, want to thank you before we start wrapping up here um, for your incredible work and passion. And I mean, I just feel like I'm, I'm floating here after the end of a, another long day, but um, just getting to reconnect with these animals and um, just wanted to, to toss it to you and um, let you, you know, bid everyone adieu. Uh, well, again, thank you. Um, this is, a, again, a, a, a different way to gather, um, but I'm finding it um, pretty uh, fulfilling. I, again, to, to see people from all over is, is not our usual way of, of gathering, right? So it, uh, that's been really neat. Um, but again, I, I'll, I'll say it a million times. It's like salmon bring really awesome people together. Um, once, you, once you get hooked by these fish, there's just... I don't know. There's no going back. And, you know, if you had told me, you know, I did my first book, uh, let's see, that came out in 2010, I think. And if you had told me then, and I started that book 2007, then I think that was really my, kind of my, my path to really getting, to getting hooked hard uh, into salmon. But if you had told me back then that I was going to fall in love with a fish, <laughs> I would have told you you were crazy. Uh, mm -hmm. But you know, here we are. But I, I think it goes back to, I, I think Heather was mentioning it or Melanie was mentioning it. Um, it's just, um, and, I, and I know I talked about it in my talk a little bit. It's just like in, in salmon, we see ourselves. You know, most of the time when, when most of us see salmon, we're seeing salmon at the end of their lives. And if you have ever stood on a salmon spawning stream and just watch the fish and just just it's nothing but like in determination and i am absolutely convinced that the phrase the will to live was coined by somebody that was standing on a salmon spawning stream <laughs> uh, they do not ever stop i mean you know they can have an eyeball poked out by a gull and like their flesh is tattered and they're still living they're still breathing and they keep going and they keep trying to get up that waterfall or whatever obstacles in their way and they just do not stop uh, until they die and you you can't not sit there and watch that and not start to reflect back on yourself <laughs> it's like you know who hasn't been at one point or another struggling you know or there's probably moments of every day when we struggle right you know but then you watch these salmon and just what they go through and and it's i don't know it's just like i i feel like i kind of transform into them sometimes and 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 i um i don't know just that determination and that will and just the strength and their beauty and you know everything they go through um, um i think about that a lot and and it and it gets me through uh difficult times um and then uh, i think uh, was it melanie who was saying she mentioned the word shine I never really thought about it like that before, but um, for sure. I, and for me, and I'm not even the one fishing, but just watching that circle of life unfold, um, I, it's just, I don't know, I just walk away a completely transformed uh, person and feeling like I, I am, I know my part, you know, on this earth. And, and it's, uh, again, it's hard to put into words and I'm a writer and I'm supposed to be able to do that. <laughs> And it's tough. Um, but again, I encourage all of you, like if you haven't been to Alaska, um, try and get there at some point and, and definitely go when the salmon are spawning. It's usually like July, August, September. And just sit there on a river and watch this unfold. It's like nothing you'll ever see. And I'm going to get very choked up here if I continue to talk about this. Well, I, 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 I see uh, a 
little line here from my friend Kevin, uh, Kevin Scribner, who's on the call with us. Hope and optimism is in Salmon's DNA, and that never a truer statement have I heard of. Um, well, listen, to our panel, thank you guys again so very much. Um, I'm going to put up another link here. Um, folks, if you want to uh, watch the wild trailer uh, properly, so it's not stuttering and looking horrible uh, here vis-a-vis -vis Zoom, go ahead and uh, copy-paste that link there. Um, uh, Heather Hardcastle, Melanie Brown, Amy Gulick, thank you so very, very much um, for giving us the gift of your presence tonight and for your hard, hard work. Um, I am just deeply honored by you, and um, just for uh, general information, folks, as put up in the uh, chat bar there, if you want to send me an email to connect at thewildfilm.com, just write connect in the subject line, and we'll put you on the newsletter list. Uh, as a quick update, we're um, having our first virtual event uh, screening of the wild, honoring Bristol Bay's fishermen, um, all of them, uh, the, the commercial fleet, fleet the the Drift Fleet, um, and folks that um, are going to par take part in that. It'll be May 2nd, and uh, if you if you are a fisherman, you'll be getting a notice from uh, United Tribes of Bristol Bay or um, the uh, BBRSDA. And then uh, we're going to be launching in five cities across the U.S. virtually and building toward a, uh, a national release uh, in the early, well, mid-summer, mid, early mid-summer. But uh, and until such time as we can dovetail and come back with a, an actual um, in-person gathering that we properly want to do so we can feed you. Um, but uh, in any case, love you all. Thank you for showing up tonight. Next week, we're going to watch Memory of Fish, which is an incredible biopic film from my friend Jennifer Galvin about Dick Goen, who is a legend on the legendary Elwha River. And we'll have a, another lively Q&A after that. So please join us again for that. And take good care of yourselves until we meet again. Take care and thank Thursday you all now. again. And uh, get the Salmon Way, salmonway.org. Thank you, Mark. Thank you. Thank you, you all. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Take, take care. Thanks for getting on. <laughs>